I would like to take a few minutes to uh, place this discussion in uh, a perspective, a historical perspective, near history for the world, uh, but going back for the academy and why we think this topic is so important. Uh, and I'd like to stress at the beginning uh, that uh, I thank you brave souls <laughs> that have volunteered to accept our invitation for this session, uh, because uh, I think we're trying to answer an unanswered question and encourage creative thinking on it. And it's not, I mean, it's not that we expect to walk away from this session, no matter how long it is, with the answers. But what we want to do is initiate a conversation within the academy and with all our partners as well, uh, because we think it's so important that we work on it. And I'd like to put that context first before we actually get to the, uh, the topic. And there is co-moderator Stephen Hartman. Uh, I, I'm delighted to be here, and I've been looking forward to it. And just we just started a minute ago, uh, and uh, I I will start with an. I was just explaining that I wanted to give a bit of an introduction to place why this session is so important, uh, and that it's really intended to be. I, I can't say the beginning, but the continuation of a discussion that started in the academy, to my knowledge, 25 years ago, and it may have been much before that. Uh, uh, how do we reconcile the power of science and technology with the well-being of humanity and sustainability? Because that power, we know, uh, can be utilized not only to help us <laughs> But depending how it's utilized, it can be used to destroy us. And it's pretty well doing both at the same time now. And it, uh, it poses a dilemma that's there for us, whether we're scientists or uh, tech, uh, engineers or policymakers or educators as to how do we conceptualize the world we're living in today and how do we understand the sudden and often surprising changes of direction that take place? And just to make that clear, uh, I wanted to, you know, uh, after the, at the end of World War I, uh, there was a common conception that this would be the, the end of all war. Uh, it was a, an optimistic belief, okay, we've gone through the most terrible event in history, and now at least we got over it. Uh, uh, and of course, we were surprised and disappointed 20 years later when something much worse was coming. Uh, uh, at the end of the Cold War, which was certainly one of the most exhilarating moments <laughs> in history in the last century, or maybe the most exhilarating moment, uh, one of our uh, fellows, uh, Francis Fukuyama, wrote a very famous book called The End of History. Uh, because now everything is settled. <laughs> I guess it's capitalism and democracy are going to live happily ever after. <laughs> and uh, that lasted until the East Asian financial crisis, I think, about eight years later. Uh, and in 2015, one of the most remarkable events in history happened uh, when 193 countries came together and for the first time, with unanimous consent, agreed on a set of 17 goals and 169 targets which everyone agreed to sign on to and work together to achieve. And yet 10 years later, <laughs> and not 10 years later, it, it started much earlier, uh, uh, we see things don't work exactly the way uh, we think they should. And I guess in one sense, that's the topic that we're trying to get to. We can blame events on 
COVID was not under anybody's control, we believe, and that set us back. It broke our momentum. It, dis it di distracted our attention. It stopped economic growth, and uh, it channeled all our funds to handle recovery. And then, for whatever reason, we can surmise the war in Ukraine broke out. And before we could handle that, uh, climate change, which has been around for a long time, suddenly hit high peaks of dimension, uh, dimensions. And then AI uh, reared its head and not only offered to be the most, the greatest technological breakthrough in history, but also potentially the greatest threat uh, that humanity has ever come to. And do we have a conceptual system or an understanding of what's going on? Uh, we, we've had analysis beyond end on the origin and the breakout of uh, COVID and, and of the war in Ukraine and even what's going on in Palestine now. We know the whole history going back, uh, not decades, but even millennium, uh, if you want to go back far enough. But there seems to be something missing. Uh, in 2008, 2098, the Academy had a General Assembly at Vancouver, Canada, and we had a special session, uh, and to my knowledge, it was the first time, uh, on saying, we need an integrated theory of how society evolves and develops. And we had a half a day session dedicated to this with about 50 of our very top fellows actively and we published a booklet which i think i circulated the link to our panelists and it's uh, it can be made available to anybody who wants it uh and the next year we had a three-day meeting in india uh just focusing on this topic and the themes and issues that came up followed through in many of our discussions after that, but we never really got to uh, the answers we were looking for. Uh, and then in 2013, we were invited by the UN office in Geneva uh, for a program called Global Challenges and Opportunities. Uh, and in trying to grapple with the characteristics of those challenges and opportunities, we found that our disciplinary expertise in economics, in political science, in psychology, in environment, and in, virtually, in anthropology, we pretty much were, had representation from, uh, from all the disciplines. Uh, when we looked at things from different perspectives, we understood we've got a problem. <laughs> and we understood there were a lot of things we should do, uh, but the knowledge didn't really tell us how we could accomplish it. Within two years from that, actually a year and a half from that, uh, the UN came out with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which as Jeffrey Sachs said, this was such a great breakthrough because it was the first time take the ideals in, uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948 and try to translate it into a global action plan that we're going to all work to realize. And the next three or four years were quite encouraging. Uh, the kind of progress was made uh, uh, in some areas was quite impressive. Uh, and the enthusiasm and cooperation among countries of the world in a collective effort was really unprecedented. We'd never seen anything like this. And then by 2019 already, uh, we begin to see some unusual things that looked like going in, turning around. Uh, the, the withdrawal of the, the sweet relationship between China and the US, the US began to fear that China is going to catch up and compete. And therefore, we have to withdraw a lot of uh, uh, things we had built up. I'm just mentioning it as one of many, many examples. And at that time, the UN in Geneva again asked us to work with them on a project which was called uh, uh, 
global leadership in the 21st century. Because unless we understand the dilemma we're having, and unless our leaders understand this, and there wasn't much and hasn't been much indication that anybody really understands, uh, uh, we, we understand the pieces, but we don't seem to understand the whole. Uh, and uh, we met and in initiated this project in Baku, Azerbaijan, and Jeff Sachs happened to be there. And we invited him to the meeting and he said, you know, what we really need is a theory of change. Not the theory of change that explains how we come out of a recession or deal with unemployment or even the preliminaries of building a nation state, but a theory of change for global society. And it made us reflect that there's no time in history when humanity as a whole has come together and said, look, we've got to put our heads together and we've got to figure out how to get out of this mess or how to take work together and live together in a sustainable way because it's not working anymore when each nation is for itself and trying to fortify itself. It's not working. And we don't even have a theoretical or diplomatic or political or legal uh, uh, framework for how to do that. And we certainly know when the UN was founded uh, as, as, and as a, the greatest institution up until that time, it also didn't either have a framework for that, it didn't even have the intention for that. I mean, most of the founders, their goal was to preserve the, uh, the colonial system. <laughs> The, 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 uh, Britain and France and Italy and, uh, and France and others, their goal was not to, dis to dissolve uh, colonialism. Now we can go back to maintaining uh, our empires. And within 15 years, the empires had uh, all dissolved uh, uh, at the same time. So I'm trying to put this in a, in a context. Now we're in an, at a time with unprecedented technological and economic achievements and capacities, and in, by many measures, in spite of all the bad news in the press, we're, we're better off, humanity as a whole is better off than it's ever been before, but also more threatened uh, than ever since, uh, uh, we've never had the time since 1945, and even then it wasn't done, that uh, nuclear powers have actually threatened <laughs> to use what they've built. Uh, and uh, that was the silent fear. But now we're coming out and waving it. That was not uh, considered. And the result is, at a time of increased capacity, we also have rising levels of uncertainty, distrust, anxiety, and insecurity uh, when we have more capacity to meet our needs than ever before. So this is the backdrop for uh, the discussion we would like to have. Uh, and we don't expect, expect to come out of here with formulas uh, or you know, answers. What we'd like to do is uh, we put it before you with a series of very challenging questions, uh, not to embarrass anybody, <laughs> Certainly, but if asking for your help and for those of everybody who's present to give further thought to this and help the academy uh, and all who would partner with us work more seriously at trying to understand, not with simplistic explanations, but with a knowledge that will give us a power for accomplishment and which, which will give us the guidelines of leadership Oh, we all can draw up a list of idealistic solutions. We, can, we know how to solve the climate problem today. Uh, only thing is, we don't know how to get the people who have to do it to do it, uh, and the people who have to cooperate to do it. So in a sense, we have a theoretical knowledge of what would do it, uh, but we don't have, uh, we know how to solve the, the, the nuclear threat, except we don't know how to persuade those who have the nuclear powers <laughs> at the power to give them up. 
we know how to improve a multilateral system that's really much more representative. And we've had wonderful studies and there are uh, uh, projects going on to formulate solutions in that, but we don't know how to go from where we are today to that. Uh, so it's not a theoretical knowledge we need, it's a practical knowledge. We don't know how to convert the anxiety and the energy that's been released, the competitive energy that's been released and channel that energy all positively so that we can solve the problems for everybody, even though common sense tells us that's the only way to solve uh, the problems. So I'm, I'm trying to pose it in an outline uh, and say we understand that there's not a single answer to this. There's not a single factor. In fact, it, it touches just about every dimension of our life, our cultures, our state and national and international institutions, our value systems, our attitudes, our histories, our perceptions, our prejudices, our beliefs, uh, our aspirations, everything concrete, our technologies, our science and discoveries, uh, every Thing that's concrete and, abs and objective and measurable and everything that's intangible and subjective yet seems to be very powerful. So with that uh, introduction, I'd, I'm trying to explain why we thank you for <laughs> joining us and joining this, which we hope will be the beginning or the next step in a discussion started, but never uh, taken to its conclusion, something that we hope many others will contribute to. We'll be publishing articles in Cadmus on it. We'll be conducting many types of events about it. Uh, but I would like to uh, uh, start it by turning this over to Stephen and uh, let's start a discussion uh, and see where we come out at the, uh, in the next hour or so. Thanks for Thanks very much, uh, Gary, and um, and thanks for for those reflections to to start us off. Uh, I think um, this is a really interesting uh, session. Uh, the questions that it that it foregrounds are are very interesting. I formulated five questions. I'm putting them one at a time into the chat window now, so that all of us can be thinking about these a bit as we're listening to our speakers. And we don't, we won't have time for five round, separate rounds of uh, questions after the speakers have given their presentations uh, to take these one in turn. But if they were sort of in the back of our minds as we're listening to what our, our speakers uh, are contributing now, and uh, if they're help to us to structure the discussion that will come out of these individual presentations, I think that could be useful for a, for a, a broader uh, dynamic within this session, uh, if we're going to be hearing from audience members too, who may be posing questions. So um, uh, with these five questions in mind, um, I'll just read them aloud really quickly so that we, we, we have them uh, in the, in the four of our, of our thoughts. Number one, what are the reasons for the rising levels of doubt, uncertainty, discontent, polarization, tension, disruption, and conflict within and between societies at a time of unprecedented social advances? I'll, I'll, so as I read them, I will share them one more time to everybody. The second question is, what catalytic strategies and practical initiatives can be introduced to redirect and focus the rising social energies for constructive purposes beneficial to all. Uh, number three, what potential sources of individual, organizational, and collective leadership, uh, intellectual, political, institutional, moral, spiritual, can be mobilized to more consciously guide the world community into a period of peaceful, equitable, and sustainable futures for all? That's number three. Number four, what insights and conclusions can we draw from past and recent experience regarding the underlying social processes spurring and retarding the gradual evolution of global society today? And then finally, number five, uh, what measures can be adopted to promote 
a social cohesion and consensus among youth and other sections of global society for a shared vision and commitment to steps that protect and promote human society for all present and future generations. This is the question of the moment as we uh, are getting ready to move into the summit of the future uh, in September at, at, U, at the UN. So um, with these five questions in the back of our minds, uh, I'd like to begin to invite the individual uh, panelists to, um, to contribute their initial contributions, uh, and then we'll lead into what I hope will be a more dynamic conversation among panelists and with input, I hope, from the audience as well. So the first speaker I'd like to invite to to um, to contribute is Elena Mustakova, the co-founder of Unitive, Unitive Justice and Global Security Synergy Circle, and uh, a member of the board of uh, Bridges URI Cooperation Circle. So please, um, Elena. Very honored to be part of this panel. Uh, thank you for this amazing opportunity and for the really powerful question, what theory of uh, change for global society and social evolution do we need at this time? What understanding do we have? I happen to be a developmental and evolutionary psychologist um, and a lifelong educator. And I have really witnessed the powerful convergence in, in really the last decade of uh, the physical and the social sciences and spiritual sources in terms of painting a new understanding of reality, a new story of reality that we're still having a bit of a hard time to grasp. But from an evolutionary perspective, it actually makes a lot of sense, brings together the five questions that are so poignantly uh, put in front of this panel today and I think point us to some very clear directions. I would suggest that the conceptual understanding that is emerging is one of dialectical evolutionary understanding. Mm -hmm. So we know that um, consciousness is our reality. This is the new story that science has given us, a story that was unknown until very recently, that the nature of reality is actually consciousness and the nature of consciousness is to evolve. For psychologists, that's not new. We have understood for a long time that adult consciousness has the capacity to evolve through some very advanced stages and that what is true in individual development is also true in collective development. But here I want to step back and also suggest that dialectical evolutionary processes are always very turbulent. Uh, and when people are in the midst of an evolutionary growth, they tend to feel that they've lost their way. And that's in a way very much what uh, Gary, you described in our collective processes starting around 2019, just when it looked like we had really found a unified way forward, we started to lose our way. So what was happening and what was the reason for this um, intense polarization that is still deepening? Well, I would suggest that at this point in time, people really do not know who they are and what they're living. The materialist view of human nature and reality has so shrunk our consciousness about what is life uh, that we are fraught with insecurities and fears, intensified by unprecedented speed of change and the rapidly intensifying global crisis. And of course, these fears and insecurities are acted out in the context of societies fraught with inequality and deepening corruption. So people are paddling harder and harder to maintain a sense of normalcy amidst the old story of dominance over competition for success and biosocial conflict, which is still the dominant story, despite our advances at higher levels forward. So most people recognize the loss of moral authority and the disintegration of institutions in our age, but they do not know how to make sense of such profound loss of human decency, except to imagine a return to a stabler past. When we add to that, the fact that globalization has been perceived mostly 
as the globalization of corporate corruption, of geopolitical maneuvers, and of migration, it is no wonder that people are pushing back, united by one thing, and that's a common enemy. So it is very clear, as Gary, you mentioned in May, that it is time to address the unfinished business that hasn't been addressed until now, which undermines our ability to move towards solutions for which we have the knowledge. So what are the sources that we can draw on? Sources of leadership, catalytic strategies, practical initiatives that can mo mobilize constructively the world community and create a unifying vision to move forward through this turbulent time. Uh, because time is limited, I'd like to focus on two uh, sources that I see as very powerful. Uh, that's obviously not a comprehensive uh, examination, but just a way to begin the conversation. One is the power of civil society, and the other one is the nature of education for social evolution. So uh, I'd like to start with civil society. Civil society has marked such extraordinary advances in terms of leadership, and especially in recent years in the preparation for the Summit of the Future, the recommendations put together by civil society through the Road to the Summit discussion series towards the Pact for the Future are so extraordinary. And yet it is my impression as somebody who tries to work close to the ground as well as on the macro level, that average people have no idea of the vision of civil society. We need a massive educational campaign to help this vision reach everyone. For example, civil society put together the need to create societal institutions that reach beyond single issues, such as health, peace, development, sustainability, etc., and advance all issues in an integrated and coherent manner. This is extraordinary and very revolutionary a vision. And they actually further point out that that requires a qualitative shift in our thinking. One of those missing unaddressed pieces that Gary was mentioning, the connection between inner and outer, the need to draw from the conversion between scientific and spiritual understanding. So that is a vision that needs to reach people in practical ways. Another really powerful suggestion is to declare a planetary emergency. The declaring of a planetary emergency has the power to awaken people to the realization that the poly crisis that we're living affect every person's well-being. And so here the physical and the social sciences and the humanities and the arts can work together to show that this perfect storm we're in can be solved, but not by returning to the past or reshuffling business as usual. But it actually requires us to grasp the dynamic interdependence of all living systems and to learn what are sustainable systems and regenerative approaches. And again, civil society has gathered a lot of understanding, but there is still an educational gap. And finally, before I go to education, there has been a remarkable push again from civil society to create the proper international architecture that crafts mechanisms for protecting human security. For example, there is a recommendation to make mandatory for all states, the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court, which exists for 20 years now. These are charter change proposals. Uh, there is a global civil society organization, Integrity Initiatives International, that is working to uh, facilitate the treaty for the creation of the International Anti-Corruption Court, another way to restore trust in humanity and to build more sense of unity also an international court for the environment. But of course, in all of these initiatives, there comes in the need for an education of a new kind, education for social evolution, which fosters a higher consciousness. We don't have that kind of education yet. And so what does that mean? Uh, in my understanding and in my practice, as I've recently been working on actually creating a uh, transdisciplinary institute um, that focuses on this kind of education 
in the grassroots, it needs to really redefine human nature and reality from the reductionist view that makes people think in terms of individual survival to reflecting the new story emerging from scientific discoveries, the story of our interdependence, of the non-local consciousness-based nature of reality, and of the fact that our shared reality is consciousness and its nature is to evolve. And that each next stage in this evolution develops a more encompassing and more coherent worldview. Systemic transdisciplinary education, which starts from this foundational psychological and philosophical perspective, will teach history as an evolutionary process. And it can help people understand that we are now living a uh, parallel, the parallel unfoldment of two contrary collective spiritual processes. One is the violent dying out of a world based on domination. And parallel with it is the painstaking birth of a, birth of a world founded on cooperation and compassion. And that's how evolution always proceeds. It's a dialectical struggle between the old and the new. And when history is taught in such an evolutionary way, people can actually understand what they're living and can make much more conscious choices. It would also help people understand that each next stage of human social organization aspires and has historically aspired to create greater justice for larger circles of humanity. And that this process is never smooth nor linear and is fraught with dialectical tensions. But when we understand what we're living in this way, we're a lot less scared, a lot more empowered, a lot more conscious of the choices in front of us. And this is not what we learn currently in education. Yeah. That would also help people recognize that stages of greater and greater coordination through respective social structures point towards the need for planetary coordination to ensure human security and justice for all. And that planetary regulation does not threaten the local, that it can actually be decentralized, it can empower local governance at the grassroots. So we need to discover through this kind of evolutionary integral education, a new dialectical relationship between local, national, and global, a relationship that no longer allows for national and corporate interests to triumph over common human security. Another important aspect of such education is it has to cultivate a level of psychological maturity that is needed for this age and which is well above and beyond what used to be considered mature in the past, something that's no longer functional at the new level of systemic complexity. Again, the social sciences, the humanities, and the arts must cultivate what I have described in my earlier research as critical moral consciousness spurred into social and planetary engagement by activated dimensions of moral motivation. That, again, is a process that brings together the science, uh, sciences, ethics, philosophy, and spiritual sources. And people must also be educated in the relative nature of all of our divisions and social constructs of identity. They must develop consultative skills. Now, consultative skills are so different than discussion and debate as we now witness them. Consultative skills are something that is much more democratic, much more circular, much more organic and collective. And consultation across different identities allows us to move forward together. We need models for that, collective models on every level and especially among the youth. And finally, an evolutionary perspective allows people to understand that the teleology of human development, individual and collective, is maturing towards unity consciousness. There's science behind that. That is not wishful thinking. This science needs to become well known. It needs to be taught at every level. It can be taught in elementary school as well as advanced university and postgraduate degrees. And finally, education needs to offer an integral perspective of the dynamic between individual and collective. 
we are coming out of an age of extreme and radical individualism. And before that, and I specifically have been raised in extreme collectivist uh, societies. And so these tensions between collectivism and individualism are outworn. We need to understand the dynamic so that every person can appreciate the value and purpose of collective institutions and their ability to contribute systematically and in an informed way. So in wrapping up, we need educational institutions of a new kind. Ones that take a culturally informed ethical perspective on every discipline, that bring disciplines into meaningful collaboration and truly engage life from a dedication to the super confessional spiritual principles of the social good and the advancement of planetary civilization. When education models such an understanding, policies, decision makers, and uh, public servants will undoubtedly follow. But we need to close the gaps between the knowledge and the practice here. And I think education has the power to close that gap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Elena. Um, that was that was very eloquent and uh, and actually, you know, um, very moving uh, to hear. And so I want to thank you for that uh, for that contribution. Uh, I would like to just see if anyone in the uh, among the panelists uh, has a question that they would like to ask Elena before we move on to the next speaker. From Carlos. Yes. Can I say something about the Elena presentation? Elena, I like so much, so much. Um, uh, you have pointed many, many important issues. Uh, for me, one of them is the necessity to reflectionate or to put together individual and collective. In social sciences, I, are, I am anthropologist, we emphasize again and again the collective, the collective, the group, the social, the social. But now, now, the neoliberalism, neoliberalism in the in the new capitalism, put the emphasis in individualistic consumers, individual, individual. Okay, we have to do a new theory, a new topic of person, of person. The, the person is individual and community. The person, the person, the, the, each person, not not each individual, each person is individual and community again. And you put one of the contributions is this dialectical in uh, between individual and collective. Thanks and, and other things. Uh, I I emphasize that, uh, Elena. But you you, you uh, all other uh, you. Uh, all the other contribution is the necessity of a new consciousness. Consciousness in this period is new period of the human evolution. It's a new period. We need a new consciousness. No nationalist, no regionalist. We need a planetary, a world conscious. And you put again this uh, in, on the table. Thanks a lot. Hmm? Perfectly yeah, expressed. Right. Thank you. So thanks very much. Um, that was a great beginning. And uh, uh, of uh, the other panelists, I mean, Gary already gave us a great beginning. And so we have two great beginnings now. And I'd like to invite Piero, please, to uh, to give his presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Piero. Oh, I'm sorry. And Piero is my, my very, my very good, so much. Uh, my very good <laughs> friend and, and colleague. From uh, uh, you know, from chaos, and who's the scientific director of of chaos? Who's the UNESCO Institute's a policy lab uh, expert? And um, and uh, uh, welcome, Piero. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, uh, dear Steer, my my friends, and thanks to all. So there are there are, and I start my timer because uh, because we have. Um, there are several fundamental points that will be discussed in a, in a few minutes, in a few seconds, and uh, and uh, I apologize uh, for the extreme brevity with which I will address them. So I think uh, also in continuity with the, with the very interesting uh, speech of the uh, of the my colleague that we are faced with, uh, with the decisive challenges 
uh, that are, uh, um, first of all, epistemological and uh, educational challenges because uh, they closely concern knowledge and uh, the methods uh, uh, by which we intend to attain it and uh, subsequently share it in order to solve the problems of us humans who are a whole. And the fundamental problem is that uh, uh, our organization and, uh, and, and uh, first of all, the educational and training institutions uh, themselves uh, are still built uh, and characterized by logics of uh, closure, of confinement and separation of knowledge and skills, uh, and above all, continue to be designed, projected as mechanisms that are complicated system and not as organism that are complex system. From this point of view, um, uh, transdisciplinarity itself uh, is a challenge, is a credible challenge that does not only concern uh, scientific researchers uh, or academics, uh, it concerns our living together and our democracies. Uh, so without any doubt, uh, we are facing uh, a reality characterized by increasing complexity That's, uh, that, as you know, uh, does not mean uh, more difficult or more big. Um, uh, it's an, it is um, underlined, underlined the, the uh, deeply uh, relational and systemic dimension of life and of the social system uh, by ever deeper and more intense networks and dynamics of connection interdependence and systemic relationships. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, much more scientific knowledge and technological innovation that allow us to recognize these uh, profoundly systemic and relational dimension of social and living ecosystem. At the same time, we still struggle to realize that emergencies, unpredictability, and what's so-called black swans are structural and constitutive elements of complex system. So the fact that we, education and training and research, continue to, to be unprepared for this kind of emergency, this unpredictability, this uh, constitutive and systemic uncertainty make the inadequacy and problematic nature of the choices and strategies that we humans adopt even more evident. My profound conviction um, is that uh, at the root of, uh, of most of the problems we face, uh, in addition to growing social and cultural inequalities and asymmetries, is that I called in the middle of 1919, the error of the errors, the worst error, the confusion between a complicated system that are observable, measurable, manageable, predictable, and that are mechanism and complex systems. Neither observable nor measurable in all their dimension, because as you know, there are the emergent properties that uh, uh, are observable only, only during the evolution, non-linear evolution of the system. So I think that this is the worst error an educational and epistemological error on which we have built uh, our educational and training institutions and the very architectures of knowledge and skills uh, hindering the effective and concrete dialogue between uh, disciplinary fields and uh, considering only certain knowledge and wholly hyper-specialism as useful, useful, the fundamental principle of the neoliberalistic uh, uh, approach to uh, school and to university for the hyper technological civilization. So we are still a long way from a truly transdisciplinary systemic and long term preparation and vision, which is will be uh, decisive in uh, uh, tackling problems with global and indeed the systemic implication. So systemic change uh, regards complex dynamic systems open to the environment whose change and interaction initiated among subunits give rise to what is termed self-organization or emergence and a universal phenomenon that is responsible 
for the appearance of uh, life itself. Uh, so what social leaders, political authorities, uh, uh, experts, intellectuals, scholars, and uh, last but not least, economists fail to realize, uh, also when we talk about uh, uh, economic development, is the inescapable necessity that uh, su such change, systemic change, begin at the bottom level among the smallest and most uh, unassuming elements in the system. So we continue to invoke, uh, for example, excellence, calling for the best of the best, uh, the top talents, uh, the most highly celebrated uh, geniuses from the hosts of the most prestigious institutions to spark off, implement, and execute the metamorphosis we need in order to transform society in the most positive, efficient, and enlightened manner. Uh, yet, despite the undeniable importance of a complex systemic approach on the part of the leaders chosen for their brilliance and integrity, true and profound change, that is social and cultural change, can only come about from the bottom up. A transformation that will never be realized as long as the protagonists are taken solely from the select groups of elites and or intelligentsia, but more arise from a conscious, deliberate action intent on widening the foundation horizontally as amply as possible through processes of really inclusive education and literacy, not only digital literacy. Because as you know, genuine societal sorry, transformation consists of uh, local, national and global citizens educated and trained in critical thinking uh, and towards a systemic vision of reality carried out on a long-term basis, basis uh, sorry. Another essential requirements for educating towards societal transformation, in my opinion, is to breaking up uh, what I've termed as were well, the tyranny of concreteness. Uh, educators, students, and managers alike need to find the courage to go beyond that deceptive vision that pushes us to always and have to find and to hand my speech, look for something useful is what we do even regarding our personal growth and intellectual uh, maturation. So in, in, it is, in my opinion, the passion and the interest of young people instead that should be awakened, encouraged, and brought out through a complex educational pathways that must begin during the first years of school, avoiding the great mistake of the hyper-technological civilization the idea that uh, for this uh, uh, hyper technological and hyper complex and hyper connected civilization, we need only the technicians, we need only the hyper specialistic figures. Uh, I have, uh, and I'd like to, to share with you other ideas and uh, other topics, but my time is ended. <laughs> Th thank you very much. Uh, uh, that was that was excellent, Piero. A, a lot to think about there, and um, I'd like to invite anyone from the panel or uh, in the audience if you have a specific question you'd like to follow up with with Piero to please um, raise your hand or or post it in the chat window now. Uh, congratulations, Piero. Uh, one of your points is the complexity. Uh, I feel that uh, the new period needs a complex theory, as uh, Edgar Moren and other colleagues uh, emphasize the necessity, not as simple knowledge, not as simple uh, forms of uh, things, but we need uh, a new theory uh, uh, about complexity. Complexity is, is one of the world, the important world now in the, uh, in, in the world, and but, but the the theories are uh, uh, ancient, are simple, uh, only some factors. We need a, 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 a theory of complexity. Uh, for example, for example, not only a structure, not system. No, the system has new properties, not the properties of the parts of the world. We have new 
characteristics, properties of the total, of the global ETC. I, I like your, this emphasis, your emphasis in the complexity. That's all. Well, thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, I think that is the first of, first of all, um, as I told you, and, um, and, uh, uh, an, an incredible, but very difficult epistemological challenge. Uh, epistemological challenge that, uh, as, as you know, regards uh, uh, our way to define, to recognize knowledge, and uh, our way to uh, uh, define and uh, projecting uh, the method to achieve the, the knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a very simple example, you know, that the opposite of complexity is not simplification, but reduction, as, uh, as I like to uh, to say, we are continuing to be uh, uh, educated uh, to try the solution to our problems uh, to the possibility of uh, separate and then isolate the parts, mm -hmm. the variables, the elements that constitute the systems. And today, mm -hmm. the educational and the epistemological challenge is try to educate and train to the idea that the possible solution of our problems at uh, every level of the problem is uh, in the possibility of recognize, define, and uh, create connections between the parts, the variables, mm -hmm. and the parameters. That is an, mm -hmm. an incredible strategic level where the human beings are so different from the machine. From mm -hmm. the machine. And I, and I'm so critical also about the, the same definition of uh, intelligent uh, intelligent machines because uh, i think that the same definition of intelligent machine is uh, possible only if we make on side the thinking and the, the same concept of intelligence with the uh, capabilities that are uh, logical and uh, calculated mm -hmm. capabilities but thinking as you know is based on the possibility of the uh, of the incredible abstraction and, and and the creativity. Another point, and I have to conclude, uh, Stephen, real uh, that there is another point that is fundamental. That uh, because I deal with the complexity science from almost uh, thirty years, uh, mm, the, there is another um, great risk: the possible confusion between complexity and computational complexity. Mm -hmm. I, I cooperated with. Uh, in my uh, international research, especially with the physicists and engineers. And for a lot of, of them, uh, there is a, the idea that uh, complexity is a problem of infinite sequences of data. So we have only to produce to define algorithms that uh, push order where is the disorder. But this isn't the complexity, this isn't the complexity of life and the social system. Oh. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Piero. And um, I, uh, uh, stimulating conversation, and um, I, each, each uh, new contribution uh, just triggers so many thoughts. I wanna, I wanna I go a slightly out of the order that I was going to go in because I, it's my understanding maybe that Katan Patel is, uh, it won't be able to be with us for uh, the rest of the session, so uh, or much of the rest of the session. You were well known, I think, but you know, just chair of the Force of Good, um, as uh, 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 former managing director and the head of the strategic group at Goldman Sachs, among many other uh, distinguished caps that you wear, uh, I'd like to invite you to um, to, to please um, hold forth now, please, Kevin. I'd like, to, I'd like to add a time dimension to the idea of social evolution of course. Um, which is this arc of history that we talk about. And the, the hope would be that the arc of history leads to some sort of increasing awareness or consciousness at an individual and collective level. And so we end up with more human cohesion and growth. Um, and that growth potentially is in ways to collaborate, to show each other love and compassion. And while I understand that this is possible, and it's what I would hope for, it doesn't have to be so. And it could be that the progress and the evolution of societies is towards greater and greater conquest of every asset across every boundary and to expand beyond every limit. I wanted to add three thoughts to the discussion. The first is, how do you encourage the arc of history? 
to be towards the cohesion model, recognizing the complexity we live in. Do you change value or do you change behavior? Is it, is it easier perhaps to change behavior than it is to reach deeply into the psyche or soul of an individual? And it seems like it is. Um, but if you change enough behaviors, ultimately those behaviors become ingrained and it leads to a systemic change, which leads one to the conclusion that you would still have to focus on the individual as the agent by which you change the society. Now, that doesn't have to be so, and I'll touch on that in a moment. But it seems as if autocrats and fascists through history and populists in modern times have demonstrated that one can engineer systemic change by enforcing codes of behavior, encouraging people to believe things are correct if you follow a code of behavior. And they use these to change the system. So it does not have to be top down. The model I would, I would suggest, which is highly complex, of course, is that we are a combination of our neurology, our social interactions, and our environment. And the interaction of those three is what determines who we are and determines our interaction with the rest of society. And our neurology is fundamentally wired for fear. It's instant urgent, but it's a deeply ingrained survival instinct. Love, in fact, is less powerful in inducing urgent action because by its very definition, it's calming, it's peaceful, and it grows. But for urgent action, fear is the tool. And populists have figured out that this is the tool for you. So while one may wish to engineer a society that is more cohesive, if one understands that fear is neurologically wired as a survival instinct for us to, to actually behave in certain ways, then it makes sense why the populists of today are able to understand at a deeply instinctual level. I don't claim, of course, that they understand the neurology, but they understand at an instinctual level that if they can thoroughly exploit the social media technologies and other ways to communicate, including the large communal gatherings you see in the rallies today, that that would rewire the brain of individuals en masse to live in the fear, in the anger, in the hatred, and form a community that is based on that fear. Given we're a product of the genetic, social, environmental factors that are triggered when people communicate with them that way, um, it's likely that the wiring of the brain through the genetic, epigenetic, the biology leads to a response, a social response, environmental response that is intrinsically negative, defensive, and aggressive. And so the social evolutionary trajectory is set on that negative path. One would imagine the antidote to that is that maybe we educate people more, but very educated people today are voted to kill their fellow man women and children in a very large numbers, and they can rationalize it. So clearly the education doesn't help. Maybe we think it's a stronger multilateral system. Yes, but that needs to be funded. It's a huge machinery that's global. And if it's funded like today, then it will behave like today. So that potentially is an answer, but it's not the whole answer. Then one might imagine it's the rules and regulations that every jurisdiction should have that stop the lies, stop the programming, that's negative. And yes, we're trying to do that in many parts of the world. But our democracies are voting in people who, are, who benefit from the democracy itself and are dedicated to blurring the truth. So you might imagine that, you know, how do we solve this? Is it, is it by altering? Um, and I step back and, and, uh, and find one answer in the fact that great religions in history have focused on two things, creating a movement and saving each soul, as they would express it. The mission we need now, in terms of social evolution, needs to draw on that lesson. In a time of waning religions and trying to twin religions, we still need the same thing. We need a movement that galvanizes those in community, and we need to save each individual. That's the combination. It's not just the individual, it's not just the top-down systemic change, it's the combination. And religions of old completely understood that. And as you see today, Christian religion, Muslim religion, Hindu religion, they have a billion plus followers each. And they're mostly stable, even though they decline at the edges over time. They tend to actually attract people who will be followers. 
Now, the three more simple points, and I've let go. Um, so the simple mechanistic answer first is that an individual must understand potentially what the truth is and make their choices. And technology can help us do that. An AI-enabled, simple, timely, real-time, fact-checking everything, and arming an individual with uh, a percentage even that says, this is 20% true, this is 100% true, this is 85. Clearly, one has to define what is the truth, who's doing the debt planning, and so this is still complex, even though AI could deliver it. And I'm sure someone could pro program an AI to tell lies, of course. But one part is this fact-checking, and the EU in particular seems to have dedicated some serious time to sanctioning people um, that, that follow these lines in some way and look into social media. The second, which perhaps is more important in some ways, is the Genome Project it promises genetic medicine tailored to each individual. That was the promise of the big collaborative global breakthrough in mapping the gene code. AI today promises personal development tailored to each individual. I think that's quite profound if we use the AI in that way. Our path to enlightenment, guided by technology, that tune us to be immune to the disease of fear, anger, and hate, will become a possibility as we learn how to use the AI. And so this idea of tailoring for each individual is very possible, just as we are tailoring propaganda for each individual. It is possible to tailor the path to more awareness more understanding, more compassion. Also, it takes longer perhaps because it's not fear-based, but it's longer. The third item I would add is that Trump's strategist in the White House said the answer to the complexity um, and the liberalism in the world is to flood the zone, he called it, with excrement to submerge the truth. We need to flood the zone, I believe, with solutions to every conceivable problem that every individual is engaged in, either taking or giving solutions to their fellow man, regardless of race, color, or creed, and are somehow rewarded for it. That reward, of course, comes because naturally there is also a programming in it that triggers the reward system when we do something good. We somehow know what is rewarded. Of course, you can be mouth programmed, but intrinsically we, we are triggered. The reward system of the book is triggered for good and for giving. And so this give-taking is an important part, which, which we, we need to do by helping each to help each other. And that mobilizes the individual in, in mass. So the great social evolution, or evolution perhaps, driven by religion, were very successful because they understood this duality of the movement on mass and also the individual and the need to save the individual soul. And AI potentially gives us the option to do that. It cannot be used um, because the technology will be used for the exact opposite purposes. But we can replicate the success. And because the AI and the global digital network today is so pervasive, um, it can create large-scale movements of change that are positive that could not be created previously in history. It, in history, you, you could not spread the word this far. And so we have an opportunity to do that. That's what I would have added to the discussion. I wish I, I could have heard more of the discussion so I could have calibrated better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much. And um, I, I was struck when I, when I, as I was listening to you, that we've now, in three successive um, presentations that we've heard, heard the importance of education being brought up um, as uh, critical to um, efforts to sort of galvanize societies, populations to better meet the challenges, the very uh, uh, serious challenges we're now facing. And I'm. Um, it, it caused me to think when I was listening to you reflect upon it, um, uh, the importance of the more perfect or ideal balance between education and learning um, between between knowledge, uh, let's say knowledge that can be that can you know uh, aided as far as dissemination through AI and and understanding. Uh, and so um, I just was wondering if you uh, had any thoughts about 
you know, these dimensions of, of the sort of learning and educational experiences as far as how they actually um, um, sort of need to be shaped or reshaped um, to meet new challenges facing us now in the 21st century. Can I have a brief comment? Yes. Which is that um, we, the people on this call, probably overvalue technical education and, and the real education that, that I think leads to the social evolution of the nature we're talking about is, is more deep, intrinsic, experiential. Um, it's, uh, it's the aha moment when you really understand the importance of other individuals and your us as a whole and the lack of boundaries and the lack of differences actually between them. Um, an alien looking at it would certainly conclude that we're an odd species where we kill each other and hate each other for tiny differences of skin color or tone um, or, or lines in the sand. <laughs> so the education is much more profound, I think, and it is possible to deliver that, although our education systems today are not organized to deliver that, they're organized to deliver technical knowledge. And what the AI has demonstrated in the short space of this one year is how superior it is to us on technical knowledge and regurgitating the technical knowledge. That cannot be the basis of our social evolution or our personal evolution. Um, it has to be a deeper understanding of ourselves and each other and the whole. Um, and so, and I think that we're on the brink of that. We're, there was a time when you had to hold a sermon on the mount or a, or a the Buddha had to hold a meditation in a forest. Um, now with digital technologies, we're, we're linked to billions of people instantly and we can have that discussion and we can pass that knowledge almost instantly. So I think it's a, this idea of the age of spiritual machines is upon us and our evolution is linked to it now. The AI will, uh, will outstrip it on anything technical. It already has on most factors, on, on most studies that we see. But a great opportunity. Thanks very much for those, uh, for that further reflection. And um, uh, I'm really glad that you were able to join us. So we're running a little bit behind schedule. I should point that out. But I've also been advised by Janani uh, that because we're the last session, we have a little gift there if we if we need it. And so, um, again, I'll, I'll remind everybody moving forward to try to stick to this five to seven minute length, if you can, in your presentation of your remarks. And then... Uh, um, I'm going to now ask uh, uh, ask uh, Carlos Jimenez uh, from the Faculty of Philosophy and, and, and Anthropology at the University um, of uh, Madrid to please um, to, to please give us his presentation. Thank you very much, Stefan. I'm sorry because uh, the last uh, presentation I have some difficult to to hear. But uh, anyway, congratulations to, to Ketan. Um, well, thanks, thanks a lot for this opportunity to learn and share. Um, I select uh, to answer the five questions. I have selected uh, the topic of conflict, conflict, uh, conflict and mediation from the university and as an apply, apply anthropologist specializing in migrations, in migrations and diversity management, I have dedicated many, many years to studying conflict and promoting training and interventions actions in intercultural and community mediation. My starting point is that every change, historical and now, every change process necessarily, necessarily involves tension and conflict. If we are moving toward a just ecosocial transitions, toward a just ecosocial transitions, a very complex transitions in the world, which, which I believe we must, we must, it is and then evolve, and then evolve that this transition requires an ecological economy, no classic economy, no classic economy. 
that is superated. Ecological, the S economy in the in the war is is not a part. It's the, the, the 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 total thing is the nature is the ecological economy, democratic multicultural multilateral governance, multilateralismo democrático. We need a change in mindset, as Elena said, as well as the expansion of universal citizenship, very difficult also, now with the nationalism, with the right wing, with the uh, against democracy, very, very complex, but we need an expansion of universal citizenship. We need global governance, and we don't know, we don't know, we don't know global governance, and community and planetary consciousness. And all this, all this, implies not only debates and controversies, but also political and social confrontations. Therefore, in these collective reflections toward our transdisciplinary theory of change and processes of social evolution, I suggest that we should explicitly and broadly incorporate the dimension of conflict into our reflection and conclusions. How? I consider it through two complementary ways. On the one hand, the theoretical and analytical approach to conflict, and on the other, the practical approach to addressing conflict, democracy. That is, analyzing not only what conflicts are already present today, but also anticipating which may arise in the short and medium term. On the other hand, defining how to address and manage them in a positive, peaceful, and participatory way, which I call the three Ps, positive, not negative, no Gaza, Ukraine, no, no, positive, peaceful, no violence, and participatory way. Okay, I will make a few considerations on both points. Starting with the analytical part, and just as a mere note and invitation to delve into in a few meetings, I maintain that in the current stage of human evolution, some conflict situations are especially new, significant, and on the rise. It is not possible to analyze them here in, a, in any detail, of course. By way of example, I list briefly six of these situations of increasing tension and conflict today. First, geopolitical and global hegemony conflict. This relates to the configuration of a new international relations system as China, Russia, India, and other countries do not accept the war order inherited from World War II. They don't accept. They are pushing uh, uh, on the table a, a new new war. Second, conflict problems linked to climate change, climate change and biodiversity loss. This impact new populations mobility specifically internal displacement in multiple countries and in the increasing number of climate migrants and refugees with the consequent tensions, tensions associated with these processes. Second, labor migration and settlement processes. Brings, this brings increasing challenges for coexistence and social cohesion in the current context of growing policies and attitude of racism and xenophobia. It's increasing. The, 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 the most important pot, um, topic in the last election in Europe, the most important topic in the last election in, in, the, in Europe. Of course, controversies and tensions linked to the technological revolution from the use of social network for exclusion and hate 
to the emergence and development of art artificial intelligence. Five, ethical, ethical debates and decisions related to life cycle, illness, and death, including abortion, euthanasia, surrogacy, genetic manipulation, absolutely tensions, debate, no dialogue, six, conflict situations linked to the recognition and advancement of new rights, new rights, very advancement, such as recognition of the LGTBI community, equal marriage, territorial rights of indigenous or native people, etc. Okay, I am finalizing. Thus, from an analytical point of view, the general question is, what place are we going to give to conflict in our transdisciplinary theory of change? What place? A central or peripheral? Because in the history and in the evolution, the conflict is always present. It's the dynamic of processes. And today is present and in the future will be present, increasingly present. What a place are we going to give to conflict in our transdisciplinary theory? This general question translates into several specific questions. For example, in the current conflict, what factors, what factors are repetitive and recurrent with the past history and human evolution? <laughs> what is the same? What is the same? <laughs> What can we learn from this? Okay, for example, we have a very rich backlash from different cultures about positive conflict resolution. Not, not, not only Europe and America, no, no. The Quechua's and Aymara's and in Africa, they have a very rich, I study that, okay, what traits are specific to conflict today? Moving to the on the practical part, to proposals and what to do, what to do, the challenge is how to address conflict. Here, my suggestion is to highlight mediation, mediation and the culture of peace promoted by UNESCO since 1999. I will group the possible lines of action into two broad categories, so very briefly, promoting and strengthening what already exists, some possible and some possible innovative initiatives based on their validation in projects we have directed. First is identifying, identifying and promoting existing methodologies in this field. I will mention only one very, very, very relevant experience. For years, the University Conference for the Study of Mediation and Conflict has been forming at an international level, currently encompassing 66 universities from two countries, or 12, 12 countries, with master and uh, services of mediation, etc. It would be, it would be, Jerry, a very positive, and I, pro I propose this, to articulate and collaborate between the academy and the conference of university to study mediation and conflict. It's a, a possibility to, to emphasize the mediation, the peace culture uh, in the training of the conflict, not only analytical, also in the praxis. Okay, finally, Regarding possible innovative lines in mediation, only some example, let me suggest two. Creating of uh, citizenship and democracy schools. We are talking, you are talking about education, some of you, with a strong emphasis on generating new leadership, as you said, especially among young people, young people, in, in, in schools, 
in, uh, with and focus intergenerational, intergenerational training spaces focusing on participatory methodologies and alternative conflict resolution methods, M-A-S-C. Okay, the second is a uh, uh, tier or territory macro experience in neighborhoods and districts with socioeconomic precarity and high cultural diversity, we have achieved good, very good results by combining the principles, methods, and techniques of two generally separate approaches. Community development, the one hand, intercultural mediation, but other hand. Okay, as I can expose Jerry in Madrid, uh, we have a big, big project in, 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 in district with poverty, with migrants, etc., with very good results because it's a process, not it's a project, it's a process, a participatory project, and we mediate, mediate and facilitate the participation of public institutions, professional resources, citizenship, this is very complex, very difficult, but we do, but we did that. We did that mediating, facilitating the, uh, uh, I don't know the name in English, as Levera said, uh, dialogue, relationships, and spaces, uh, not probables, improbables, improbables. Okay, in short, let us incorporate conflict and its mediated management into our reflections on change and process of social evolution. Thank you very much for it. I'm sorry for the English. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I, and I appreciate the very sort of practical orientation of these uh, suggestions that you've been making here. It's, um, uh, so thanks very much. And in the interest of time, I hope you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to actually introduce, introduce the next speaker because we're now at the one and a half hour point and a little behind schedule. Um, so I hope that if there are specific questions for Carlos, that uh, please bring them up in the, in the um, chat window and we could try maybe to redirect after we've heard from all of our speakers. So Thanks. I'd like to now invite my, my dear colleague, uh, uh, Carlos Alvarez Pereira, the Secretary uh, General of the Club of Rome um, to give us his presentation. Welcome, Carlos. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everybody, for being here with us. I would like to come back to the um, to the question, to the first question that you proposed. You know, what are the reasons for the rising levels of doubt, uncertainty, discontent, polarization, tension, disruption, and conflict within and between societies at a time of unprecedented social advances? And I would like to propose a couple of provocations. What if, I mean, this fall off at a time of unprecedented social advances sort of suggests that because of social advances, we should have less doubt, uncertainty, discontent, etc. My first provocation is what if it was the opposite? The evolution of societies within and between societies, which is actually rising these uh, levels, and I will explain what I mean by that. But the other provocation is even deeper, and it's related with what I think we need to go through in, in the parts of the world where um, privileged people like us, like me, are living, you know. And, and it's the fact that it's not it's not a polarization, tension, disruption, and conflict which is rising. It is our perception of that. Because we have been, uh, for some decades, we have been cheating ourselves with this concept that some people call the liberal order. You know, and I mean, it's all too human, you know, to, we, we do that constantly. We don't have access to reality. We have perceptions that we interpret according to certain frameworks, certain mental frameworks. So it's all too human, you know, for millions of people living in industrialized countries with uh, politically democratic systems 
and seemingly peaceful societies to think, well, uh, you know, we we are uh, we are living well. We have we have made it. You know, we have made it in the sense of we have developed societies. And look, developed societies are more much more peaceful than others within and and between uh, societies. Well, that's that's a that was a terrible illusion. That was uh, something that we were telling to ourselves. This is the story of we are the developed ones, you know, the industrialized countries, if you wish, the Western world is the developed one, and the rest of the world is not developed, or at best is developing, mm -hmm. you know. Creating this bias of perception. And in particular, this perception that our development is peaceful. While it is built, and it has been increasingly built on violence, and it has always been built, sorry to say, on violence, quite obviously now on violence on nature. You know, so several of the speakers have mentioned the ecological crisis. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres speaks about, you know, says we are at war with nature and this is a suicide. So quite obviously our societies have been built on violence with nature, but especially violence with other societies. I mean, in uh, that liberal order, I, I, I find very hard to call it liberal order because it is an order built on total inequity between the West and the rest, if you wish, but that means between the global minority and the global majority, and an inequity uh, which has been uh, any, any, on any occasion it was necessary, which has been an order, an inequitable order confirmed by violence, you know? So when we think, for instance, of a world uh, under the rule of law, we tend to forget that that rule of law, of law in international relations is something that we put aside. Every time our interests are at conflict with our values, we put aside our values, we forget the rule of law and we practice and we follow our interests. So, and, and the last, and the, and last but not least dimension, there is this internal uh, violence to societies, which we have seen with the decades of uh, so-called uh, neoliberal. Again, I have a lot of I have a lot of respect for the word liberal and the concept of liberal and liberalism. I I try I really find very hard to accept that the, these policies of um, growth of these policies of individualism, selfishness, competition, and build up of more social inequalities, of greater social inequalities, could be qualified in any way as liberal. But this is what happened in the last decades. And what I think is happening is that we are just awakening to that, to all of that at the same time, because, and that's my point about the social evolution, because what has happened as well in the meantime, is that most of the world has changed a lot. So now we see, you know, uh, that I would say, uh, I use the expression, the world has escaped from us. While we were thinking that we are the model of development, uh, the world now is showing us that they have other perspectives, not only other worldviews and uh, other, in many ways, other values, but also other pathways to what they consider is development. And, mm -hmm. and those pathways are in many cases at conflict with the perpetuation of our own concept of uh, development. And, and this is the end of the, sorry to say, of the liberal order, you know, that's very, very clear in the evolution, in most recent evolution, and what is happening around the BRICS in the world, if you only want to look at one aspect of the complex geopolitical uh, situation, in which 
the existing multilateral organizations um, are not anymore effective because what is blocking, and there is a lot being said about the reform of the multilateral institutions, but what is blocking uh, the reform is that the power that countries have in those institutions, and particularly some countries, and the, the still dominant power in the world, the power that uh, the, these small group of countries have in the multilateral institutions is completely dissonant with the real, real activity of what has happened and with aspirations of the global majority. So this is my diagnosis, you know, the, the social evolution between countries, within countries, and in our relationship with nature um, have made that now we're awakening from this illusion that, oh, everything was okay. Everything was in a, organized in a peaceful manner for the prosperity of everybody. No, we have to address the ecological crisis, we have to address the inequalities, and we have to address uh, uh, the necessity of a completely new international order to overcome the, the present uh, situation, the present dissonance. And just to address, to, to mention a couple of um, ideas on related to the to the later questions you know what can we do i will mention two things that we are doing two two initiatives that we are doing one is what if we reframe the role of sciences mm -hmm. and innovation and technology uh, for sustainable mm -hmm. development and this is an initiative that we have been developing the Club of Rome together with the World Academy of Arts and Science. And I want to salute, I, I think Professor Neshkovich was uh, in the room. I'm not sure he, he continues to be there, but uh, to large extent, thanks to him, we, the Club of Rome was, and a few other partners, we got approved by the UN General Assembly last year, the declaration of the International Decade of yeah. sciences for sustainable development. And all sciences, that's a, that's the first time, I think, in the UN declaration when it says, oh, sciences are not doing enough, but, and they have to work together. You know, fundamental sciences, basic sciences, social sciences, humanities, the arts, and traditional knowledge have to work together in a process which um, some people call flipping the science model. What about putting our gigantic resources? I'm not sure if you're aware, but the global spending on research and innovation, the order of magnitude is $2.5 trillion every year. And if you take that big amount, of which more or less half is public money, and if you take a significant part of that, a significant share of that, and you dedicate that to sustainable development, of course, we would be making a lot of progress in the challenges we have. So this is what we are trying to do. We created, together with WAS and other partners, something that we call the Earth Humanity Coalition, to push in that direction. Let's mobilize all sciences together to really address the challenges of humanity, but starting from them, from the challenges of humanity, starting from the, the difficulties, the, the realities that people are facing every day. And I want to signal another dimension, which I think is absolutely critical, because we have to find uh, spaces or areas where there is a strong momentum that we could, from which we could profit to change that dynamic, that confrontational dynamic uh, within and between societies that I mentioned at the beginning. And one of those areas is the relationship with younger generations. So we have been working now since a few years in the Club of Rome to develop the co a concept of intergenerational leadership. What does that mean? Well, that means that in this particular situation of history, our mission is not to transmit what we know to the next generation. Uh, because what we know is what created the mess in which we are. 
And, and the younger generations are typically more aware are, I mean, statistically, this is there are plenty of evidence that they are more aware of the challenges that they want. We, together with the partner, uh, Marine Adeng, um, and the, the youth talks uh, organization, she developed a survey on 50,000 young people from almost 200 countries. And in a, in a survey, in a very open uh, way, so it was, the question was not, do you think this or that? No, it was express your views about the future. And then uh, she used, uh, you know, some of the latest technologies to, to analyze the, fi the findings, you know, the responses by these 50,000 people. And do you know what is the, com the, the, the only common response to all of them, wherever they are, wherever mm -hmm. they are on, on the planet, they all want a peaceful future. That's a very strong message. So the younger generations, I think, are more aware than we are of the challenges of what is at stake for them. And then we have to find ways to work together. And this is why uh, we speak about intergenerational leadership. Different generations, not one generation transmitting to the next, not the nice thing, the, not the tokenism of let's sit uh, a young person at our table, no. But not either the idea of let's integrate the younger generation in the existing system. It's a much more ambitious call. It's the call that we have to work different generations together to transform the system. Which, by the way, is what is the most positive message that we can expect to get from the Summit of the Future in New York in September. Because I think the, the people, the UN, uh, the people involved from the UN side in preparing that realize that, oh my God, in this context of uh, geopolitical conflict and total mistrust between countries, the best we can do is to highlight the role of younger younger and future generations. You know. Well, let's not only highlight that, let's work with that as part of the momentum, as part of what will give us momentum for the, for the transformation which is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. That was very refreshing and original. <laughs> uh, uh, we're going to try to bring this meeting to a, a close with after one more speaker. I just wanted to, you called to mind your very interesting comments about uh, uh, conflict uh, and progress. Uh, you know, our former f president, uh, Harlan Cleveland, uh, when I met him the first time, I started talking to him about the revolution of rising expectations. And uh, as a real driving force for change. And he said, well, do you know where that phrase came from? I said, no, I don't know. And uh, he, he gave me the Bartlett's familiar quotations. And mm -hmm. that quote, that phrase was credited to him in 1951 when he was watching the developments in East Asia uh, after the uh, end of the, the, the war. Uh, and then I, I, I had mentioned it to him because I had met a, a very distinguished Indian uh, security expert who had used that phrase uh, he was also a member of the academy, uh, Jasjit Singh. And he said, he's observed something else about this revolution of rising expectations. That the more expectations rise, the greater the tendency for violence, um, because the expectations, the gap between the expectations and the achievement keep widening. The expectations grow, even when there's development, the expectations rise faster than the accomplishments. <laughs> and so a sense of discontent often comes. So anyway, I'm not trying to uh, philosophize on it. I just wanted to highlight there's a deep, mm -hmm. complex truth in what you said. 
that we have to give serious thought to, uh, and uh, you help reconcile a dilemma. I'd like to, uh, Stephen had was called away, and I'm not sure whether he'll be able to come back, but he had told me that uh, he may be interrupted, we'll see. But uh, I think we should tr try to close soon. So I'd like to uh, ask Stefan Brunhuber, our final uh, speaker uh, on the list, uh, to, uh, uh, to make a contribution. Let's try to keep it uh, five to seven if we can, Stephen, uh, Stefan, and uh, Anyway, yeah. but, uh, I don't even try to keep it shorter in order to make sure that uh, we're not running out of time. And I'm, I'm not even sure whether I can make much of an added value. I'm a I'm a shrink by training and member of WAS. And uh, if I have to resonate on the social theory development, I'm learning five bullet points. I'm learning that the ontogenesis and the phylogenesis the individual and the collective follow the same rules, and it's basically a fractal order. The second thing I'm learning is that social development follows emerging structures, not linear ones. The third one, what I'm learning is I need a picture, a narrative, a story in my mind in order to better understand social development. And the story and the picture I'm using is the one of the staircase. This is true for the individual one and for the collective one. This is true for the ontogenic development and the, for the phylogenetic one. We are stepping up a staircase. And as Gary just pointed out, by stepping up, by transforming upwards, we can also regress and step down. But each time we potentially step up, we see more and see deeper. And we can enlarge our gravity of consciousness to our more insight and better understanding. And each time it's not only a theoretical, but also a practical way because we're stepping up, we're doing something. The three major, for me, the three major catalyzers for enlarging the gravity of consciousness is one is mentioned already as education on an individual level, but at the same time you can use psychedelics. If you use psychedelics, you could enlarge your consciousness. And the third is you can follow a spiritual practice. And all the three can enlarge your consciousness on stepping up that staircase. But this is just one of the three. The second one is what we've discussed throughout the entire day. It's, a, it's AI. AI is able to enlarge the way we look at the world. And the third one is what I'm particularly interested in through was is the financial sector. You know, all the three can mobilize and catalyze us helping up to step up that staircase. And we can step down that staircase, but this is the picture I'm using to better understand social theory of development. And I will leave it with that because we're all running out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you're, you left us with an intriguing uh, uh, image to uh, end with, creatively applied. Uh, I want to thank you all for a really creative, uh, thoughtful discussion. As I promised you, uh, we would not lead to conclusions, but we would lead to some very stimulating insights and lines of thinking to work on. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is an invitation. Uh, we want not only all of you who we had a chance to listen to, but all of those who we didn't to continue to collaborate with us. Uh, uh, it, it, may, it may appear like our observations were disparate, but I think when we spend more time on it, we'll see there are close relationships between the different per perspectives and different ways of approaching the elephant, we might say, uh, in the Indian analogy. Uh, so I'm very encouraged by this. It, uh, 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 I've been thinking of it for a long time, and I had some anxieties, but I'm really rewarded by your, your contributions. Thank you.